Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. Amen. God's word for a further consideration of the words of the gospel lesson. Please listen once more to just a few verses. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say because they were terrified. A cloud appeared and overshadowed them, and a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. This is the word of the Lord. Dear fellow recipients of God's grace, have you ever doubted yourself? And I don't mean that in any real big existential way, I guess. What I mean is more in the realm of simpler things. Did I turn the stove off? Pretty sure I did. But maybe I need to go check. Did I, did I lock the car? That event really happened, right? I'm not just making that up, am I? Questions like that can be really nagging and bothersome because you could be absolutely certain of something in one moment and in the next, for one reason or another, there's a sliver of doubt. That must be where the disciples were at when the gospel lesson, when the events of the gospel lesson were about to get started. Peter, perhaps, in particular. Because at the beginning of the gospel lesson, it says this was six days later. And it was six days after Peter had just heard Jesus talk about his impending betrayal, suffering, death, and resurrection. And the first three points on that list really bumped that last point about the resurrection out of Peter's mind because he speaks up and just says, No, Lord, this will never happen. It couldn't possibly be, in his mind, it couldn't possibly be that this profound teacher, this miracle worker, whom Peter himself had just confessed to be the son of the living God, would suffer such terrible things like Jesus was talking about. But when he voiced that concern, that opinion, his words were met with a very stern rebuke. How puzzling that must have been. You can almost picture him and the other disciples maybe scratching their heads a little bit. Doesn't this guy drive out demons? Haven't we seen him walk on water and, and, and calm storms? That Lazarus thing, that really did happen, right? He was in the grave for a few days. And Jesus raised, I'm not making that up, am I? This is the Messiah I've expected, I, I, that I've followed, I've confessed. A am I wrong? Is Jesus not the Messiah? Whatever questions like these may have been rattling around in his head, as he, with James and John, go up that Mount of Glory in an instant blaze, Peter, James, and John got their answer. No, they were not mistaken. This Jesus is true God and true man. He is the Son of God, whose life and works are well-pleasing to the Father. The Father declares that it is still the case, just as it was at Jesus' baptism several years ago, that he loves this son of his. So don't question what Jesus teaches, even when it makes little sense to you. Listen to him, the Father says. What a relief. Although they're, they're terrified in the moment, what a relief for Peter, James, and John this experience must have been. They weren't wrong. Jesus is the Messiah. And his teachings, you know, they've heard him talk about the resurrection and eternal life, but now they see Elijah and Moses alive and talking to Jesus about the same things that Jesus was telling them about, what he's going to do for the salvation of the world. Peter might not have known what to say in the moment because he was just terrified, but what he managed to say in his first sentence hits the mark. It was good for him to be there. 
It's good for us, through the words of the gospel, to be there too. Because often in this world, we are tempted to let some nagging slivers of doubt rise in our own minds. You know, we've enjoyed Christmas. We've, we know all about Good Friday and Easter. For many of you, perhaps from little on, that rhythm of the church year has revealed to you time and time again through his words and actions that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of the living God. But then life happens. Things happen. Sin happens. You know that God loves you, but you're walking out of a doctor's office, perhaps, with a diagnosis that is truly awful. And it rings in your ears as dissonantly as Jesus' words about his suffering rang in Peter's ears. You pray, you follow the advice of doctors, but it remains. Or it goes and comes back again. And the head scratching begins. But I've, I've read the Bible, haven't I? I I've heard the word, pre I know God cares about, am I wrong? Am I wrong that God cares about me? Does he not? Is there something wrong with my relationship with God? And that's a door that we really wish would just always stay closed. Because when it starts to crack open, we know who's going to come barging in. The conscience. And oh, oh, he's got answers, doesn't he? He'll point to this sin, to that sin. He'll point to things that aren't sin. But in light of how things are going, he'll strongly suggest, can you really be sure? And suddenly the countless absolutions that you've heard come into question. Well, yeah, the, the pastor does say that by Christ's command and authority, he forgives sin, but maybe those words aren't meant for me. Maybe I'm not included in that. And before you can even get the conscience turned around to face the door, let alone go out, in comes his closest ally, your reason. Well, you don't really think it's as simple as, as a little water and some words, do you? As simple as, you are forgiven? As simple as a bit of bread and wine with some more words? You're smarter than that, aren't you? And now the head scratching maybe turns into more of a headache. As you think, I mean, yeah. Isn't that what's said time and time again? It's simple? Can it really be that simple? Can something that simple work? I don't know. And with that, you're in the same boat as the disciples then. Ultimately, the question is, am I right about Jesus? It's good then. It is good to be here again with Peter, James, and John atop that mountain where the Father in heaven answers you and he removes all doubt. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And there can be no doubt now. When God speaks, the matter is settled. From creation on down throughout history, that much is clear. God said, let there be, and there was. God said there would be grave consequences for sin, and there are. God said he would send a Savior, and he has. And here on the top of the mountain, he declares for a second time in Jesus' ministry that he is that Savior. And he gives us very important advice. Listen to him. For this is the Savior who sends forth his messengers to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why does he do that? Well, Peter gives the best answer when he addresses a crowd on Pentecost about how to deal with their sin. Repent and be baptized. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins. How good it is then to see that baptismal font and be reminded of what Christ did for you at baptism. Yes, with, with a little water and some words, he washed away your sin, robed you in his perfect righteousness, and declares you to be his brother. 
And what a gracious and caring brother he is, for he has not left you alone since. For it is Christ who also sends forth his disciples to continually preach the good news to one another. He gave his spirit to them, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. So yes, it is as simple as those words. I forgive you your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The simplicity does not negate the authenticity. How good it is to be here then. And upon confessing your sins to hear the words of absolution, the promise and command of Christ, the Son of God. Listen to him. And tell reason and conscience to hit the bricks. And should they remain, Jesus has still another reminder for you. For it is Christ who instituted the Holy Supper, wherein, with a little bit of bread and some wine, he gives to you also his body and blood, saying, This is for you, given and shed for the forgiveness of all your sins. How good it is to be at the Lord's table and receive such precious gifts. Placed into your hand is the purchase price of your salvation. As Luther puts it in his large catechism, this sacrament is the pasture and sustenance where faith may refresh and strengthen itself so as not to fall back in such a battle, but become ever stronger and stronger. Your Savior invites you over and over to this pasture. Listen to him and put all nagging doubts to rest for good. How good it is to be here. But we don't build tents in church. Just as the disciples did not build tents on that mountain, they went back down. The Savior to his work of salvations, of salvation, the disciples, to witness that work and to share it with others. And we go out from this place that is so wonderful to be at. And we witness to the world about what we have here seen and heard. For the Son of Man has risen from the dead. His work is complete. And it is our privilege and joy to share that good news with as many people as we can. So that as many people as possible can come to the Lord in word and sacrament and reach the same wonderful conclusion. It is good, Lord, for us to be here. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.